if you've been watching the show for even half as long as I've been doing it, you'll know that I often call Schlocktoba my own personal escape from the weekly grind of keeping the brand relevant or topical in the era when this was a weekly reliable upload schedule. In some ways, it still is that, but in other ways, the show, and I'd like to think myself as host, have grown into the understanding that while escapism is healthy, there's a difference between wanting to take a break from being fully immersed in the all-encompassing noise of topical breaking news discourse and the obligation those of us in the professional opinion haver class have to have opinions on those things and tell you about them when we do, and completely willfully shutting out the world and the important things going on in it. It's one thing to recognize the need for a break from this or that argument of the day and one's own mental health, but you don't want to so actively seek total disengagement that you turn into the kind of person who not only feels unhappy with the present state of things, but flies into a white-hot emphasis on white, how dare you try to unplug me from the Matrix rage at even being reminded that the world of the present or the current year exists outside whenever you're trying to hide from it, like whatever was happening with this person-shaped thing. Anyway, that's basically a long and perhaps slightly too defensive way of me priming the pump to say if you notice any sort of topical tinge or relevant to the world around us bent to this or that selection of features this year, no, I didn't set out to make some more sweeping statement than usual, I'm not trying to spoil anyone's Halloween fun, especially my own, it's more just an acknowledgement that there's a political dimension to everything, because politics is simply the infrastructure of relations between people and the running of their society and civilization. Yes, even a movie about a serial killer who figures out how to kill people through the phone. Science has created the ultimate instrument of death, your phone. <laughs> Pushes a button and kills by phone. Would you answer murder by phone? Not only because in between the reason this movie exists and or hey I got an idea for a movie scenes of what if you picked up the phone and instead of someone yelling at you or just being weird or whatever your fucking head got blowed up, the plot filling the spaces is a sort of a corporate conspiracy thriller about how telecom monopolies are bad and the industry funded scientific studies will be used to cover up big business malfeasance, but we're mostly still here for the phone kills. Smith. No, the political dimension here is that Murder by Phone is a 1982 Canadian film, and in fact part of the tail end of a boom time in Canadian national cinema known as the Tax Shelter Era, which was exactly what it sounds like. In 1975, the Canadian government decided that it wanted to supercharge the country's domestic film production business, and instituted a policy whereby if you were a Canadian taxpayer, invested money in making a Canadian-produced movie, you could take a write-off of up to 100% of that investment, yes, 100% as in all of it, on your taxes. Yes even if the movie failed, the investors would still get their money back and the government would handle it. Money, money. Money! Did it work? I mean, of course it worked. They let people write tons of taxes off so long as they dumped it into movies first. Thing is, if you're smart, or you think you're smart, you also want to make some profit back up front, so what kind of movies ended up getting brought to investors in the first place, at least at the beginning? Stuff that wouldn't cost too much to make, but could potentially hit a high return. Horror, budget sci-fi, gritty action, B-level copies of Hollywood blockbusters, lowbrow comedies, or sometimes interesting provocative stuff that hungry young artists could smuggle in disguised as one of those. Hello, Mr. David Cronenberg, whose career as a filmmaker of note pretty much exists exists because of early films he got made under the tax shelter system. Within five years, the output of domestic movie production in Canada increased by a factor of 25. Uh, that's 25 times the number of movies, not 25 movies total. That explains a lot. But because the types of movies largely getting produced, not all, but many, were often of a disreputable character in the eyes of, for example, some Canadian film critics who'd previously held up the country's standard as an alternative to the Hollywood profit-driven system to the South as a kind of status symbol, it was heavily criticized in the media, one critic titled a review of Cronenberg's Shivers with you should know how bad this film is after all you paid for it and thus not very strongly defended when the inevitable question of is this really the best use of federal resources honestly inevitably came up over the much more salient issue that letting businessmen use productions as tax shelters would lead to bloated cost overruns, poor management, outright corruption, and bad oversight all around. But some of the movies actually kind of good. Not this one though. Sounds pretty off the wall to me. I mean a telephone killing people. I've told you nothing but facts. Thank <laughs> you. 
Murder by Phone almost plays like a parody of Tax Shelter era Canadian sci-fi horror, except that no one making it knows it's funny. High concept premise, elaborate violent effects driven death scenes, slumming a list of the B-list actors like Richard Chamberlain and John Hausman doing all they can to sell that yes, this is really a movie about getting blown up by your phone, and some mild gestures in the direction of anti-corporate muckraking. Ostensibly, it's a murder mystery. A young woman is, well, murdered by phone in an opening scene. Oh, that's why they call it that. Her father reaches out to Chamberlain as his old friend Nat Bridger, college professor and environmentalist lecturer, to investigate because he thinks the reported cause of death, a healthy 19-year-old suffering a random heart attack, is suspicious. Drugs? Drugs? I'll have to say drugs, too. So he launches into detective work that mostly involves walking into the police station and the phone company and annoying people while pretending not to know things he mostly already knows. Thank you for letting us know. We'll have someone... It's already been repaired. I'm interested in knowing... why. Well, you might try a letter to our service people. Well, I thought I'd try in person, as you can see. Perhaps your supervisor could give me a hand. I'm afraid this really isn't the right department to answer your question. Then I would like to speak to your supervisor. I'm sorry, Mr... Bridger. And let's not make a big deal out of this. Uh, please, your supervisor. <laughs> once the phone company makes it belligerently clear they 100% are covering something up. The young woman had a heart attack there. A witness suggested it might in some way be related to a telephone. I don't know, a malfunction or something. That'd be impossible, of course. Of course, but... Maybe I could just find out why the phone was replaced. Go home, Mr. Bridger. The law protects us from people like you. Yeah? And just what the hell protects the people from people like you? I've seen the telephones, Webb, so you know I know. I don't know about any telephones, Bridger. And what you know gets you less than bus fare. And after that, it's... Yeah, basically a movie about watching a dude go through the extremely meticulous details of here's how easy it is to do amateur sleuthing via property vandalism, lying to the cops, illegally trespassing, and breaking and entering when you're a mild-mannered looking white guy so everyone assumes you belong there. In between the actually very entertaining phone that blows you up scenes. Hello? Dr. Markowitz? Yes? You're getting too close. Close to... What I do? until it's time for the movie to be over, so he solves the crime just by kind of going into the right room in the phone company's basement, finding the machine that blows you up through the phone, and saying, hey, that looks like a machine that would blow you up through the phone, to another guy who then says, oh yeah, good eye, that's the machine that blows you up through the phone. You could send a thing like that down the line? Sure, yeah. Use the receiver as a capacitor. Store up the voltage input to the point of spontaneous discharge, and, uh... Sounds simple. Not really, no. You working on it or something? Uh, sort of, yeah. Next stop is St. Louis, and he's gonna come back through Chicago on his way to Detroit. Thanks. You know, for a security guard, he had an awful lot of information, don't you think? I do like the very realistic time is a flat circle, early 80s resigned cynicism where the return of corporate monopolism is treated as such a nihilistic fact of life that once this is worked out, the phone company, which has in fact been covering up the whole someone is killing people with phones murder spree, is all too eager to help the hero set up an elaborate third act sting operation to bring the perpetrator down once they figure out who it is, and the idea that they're gonna get away with the rest of it, like the covering up and all, is just kind of an accepted, yeah, I guess that's gonna happen fact. To hell with him. Let's go to the media. You really think that's a responsible thing to do? Create mass hysteria, get us shut down. Do you realize what that would mean? About two dozen people would die every 60 seconds because they couldn't contact a doctor, a policeman, a fireman. You had any ransom demands? It 
It's all being looked after by the brightest and best at every level. Yeah, every level except police. Later. Talk to the commissioner. This is Mr. Gilsdorf. He's here to represent the commissioner's office. Right, Mr. Gilsdorf? That's right. You know anything about electrical flashback? Of course. Odds are the call will come through on the main number, sometimes just four ten. Uh, from a local exchange? Yeah, I'd say you're looking at a four-digit trace. This is going to take some time. God damn it, I started as a lineman. I know how long it's going to take. You damn fool. I'm helping you. I'm helping you get rid of the world's real garbage. Lock on three, second digit. Log on three, second digit. You're stalling for time. You're trying to trace this call. Incident, Bridger. If it can be done once, well, there's nothing that you can paint or Bridger can publish which could be harmful to us for very long. Hooray! A happy ending for the rich people! And I have to imagine that it might be more funny in a surreal way for those of you under 25, 30 at this point to see what's otherwise what we'd now call a techno thriller based entirely around a then cutting edge analog world where the big buzzy new hotness is still. Cable? Switches? Long distance, the electronic switching system. All the calculations are made from this room. Designed and built by our cybernetics branch in 1977 at a cost of $450 million. And everyone is still walking everywhere, writing stuff down, taking in-person meetings, and yeah, making phone calls to do all of this tech-related investigating. I mean, I actually lived in this period for almost half my life, and watching it now feels as alien as if this is taking place on fucking Middle Earth. They're scared. <laughs> they're scared. They run the world and they're scared of what? Of you? Tough neck Bridger? What are you doing? I'm taking you up on your offer. <laughs> Better do what he says. He's a whale biologist. It's also, it has to be said, extremely well directed for the kind of complete nonsense that it is. It's really well blocked and composed, there's all these ominous established anti view of skylines, cool use of reflective skyscraper windows, effective background foreground action, solid long takes for suspense, effective mid-saturation, high contrast color palette, and it's got one of legendary composer John Barry's very few electronic synth scores as a bonus. I mean, I can't really salvage how stupid the premise is or how boring the actual on-the-page narrative of Richard Chamberlain casually sneaks around Toronto and asks people what they know about the phone that makes you blow up if you answer it, but it almost does. Come Turkey must have taken a plane tour to the receiver. Just the receiver, huh? Yeah. There wasn't even a mark on the box there. Don't really make sense. Could it have been the voltage? Maybe some in the electroacoustic transducer. You some kind of phone freak? Gym teacher. Uh, you can probably chuck a lot of that up to the director, Michael Anderson, who had a dazzlingly eclectic career before and after this, like much of the cast, is basically working below his weight class, because this was the era when Cheap Jack movie producers understood that hiring seasoned but undervalued professionals who knew what they were doing was a smart way to save money during production because you got better work back with fewer do-overs in a quicker turnaround. A British filmmaker who started out doing classy war movies and dramas, including the classic The Dam Busters, the first movie version of 1984, and taking over the troubled production of Around the World in 80 Days in 1956 before moving to Hollywood after that film ended up winning a Best Picture Oscar, in the 60s to make thrillers and action movies like Naked Edge, Flight from Ashia, Operation Crossbow, The Quiller Memorandum, and The Shoes of a Fisherman. Uh, that one is about a Ukrainian former labor camp prisoner who becomes Pope and tries to stop a nuclear war between China and the USSR, by the way. Starring Sir Laurence Olivier, Sir John Gilgood, Oscar Werner, David Jansen, Barbara Jefford, Vittorio De Sica, Leo McKern, and Anthony Quinn as the first Russian Pope. I'm sorry, will you please repeat that? I want to show you a world gone mad. 
in which we start a great country into an atomic war. Your Holiness is proposing the incredible. The impossible. You gave me absolute power. You must submit to my use of it. Words are cheap. When the future of mankind hangs in the balance, what risks do you take? The answer rests with one man. A man who walks in the shoes of the fisherman. Oh man, I've been dying to see Maniac Pope too. The first one was awesome. And then in the 70s, he went about as 70s as you can go. He did Logan's Run, Pope Joan, Dominique, Doc Savage, The Man of Brawn, and Schlocktober favorite Orca, The Killer Whale. In the 80s, he made two high-concept sex comedies, Second Time Lucky and Separate Vacations, The Jeweler Shop, which is an adaptation of a play written by Pope John Paul II. Holy Mother! It's the Holy Father! I am not worthy. And the high concept sci-fi, Millennium, the 80s TV miniseries version of The Martian Chronicles, and Murder by Phone. Throughout the 90s, he finished up with a handful of classy TV movies, a pair of family films, Summer of the Monkeys, which was generally well regarded, and the sequel to The New Adventures of Pinocchio, which was not as much. That, my friends, is the kind of life and filmography where everyone will gladly overlook the time you made a Canadian tax shelter movie about people getting blown up by their telephones. You should all be so lucky. I'll call you. This movie is actually kind of hard to find around these days. It wasn't a big hit, not super well remembered, but if you ever wanted to watch a movie about Canadians getting blown up by their phones, this this is the one to watch. Yeah, I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Schlocktober will continue next week. <laughs> <laughs>